What do three Heisman Trophy winners, a rain-soaked upset, and a stack full of pancakes have in common? How about a 10-10 tie and a touchdown run with only one shoe? Give up? Well, the answer is easy. They're all a part of Ohio State lore, and they are next in line as we continue our countdown of the best of Buckeye football, the Buckeyes' 50 greatest. With his team buried in a 24-zip hole against Illinois, tailback Keith Byers decided to take matters into his own hands. I mean, there are guys that can lose games for you, and then there are guys that can win, win games for you. Keith was one of those guys that could win a football game for you. I remember Keith saying, hey, just give me the ball. Let me run the ball, and I'm like, yeah, let him run the ball. 274 yards and five touchdowns later, Byers had the Buckeyes back on top. This may be just about the most outstanding single performance in all Ohio State football. But on a day of heroics, one special run brought the fans to their feet and Byers out of his shoes. Byers springs to the outside. Look at him go. I made the cut to the right, and as I was going down the sideline, for some reason, my shoes just got loose. Keith kicks off his shoe. You see the thing fly up, and I thought, what the devil is that? You know, to see him cut back and, you know, make the moves, and you're like, wow, wow, this is great. You know, this is wonderful. And once the, the shoe came off, I didn't want nobody to step on my foot. It was his fourth of five touchdowns that afternoon, tying an Ohio State record as Ohio State went on to win 45-38 to after trading the Illini 24 to nothing. Yeah, that is a, a play that's going down in history. That's one I'll never forget. And he simply runs out of his shoe. He's running so fast. When Coach Paul Brown came to Columbus, he inherited a program mired in a state of doubt and disarray. The man from Maslin wasted little time getting the Buckeyes back into shape. He called a meeting right away, and right then he set down what he wanted to do and the discipline, and he meant business. He was known as a dictator. He was known as a disciplinarian, and everybody here was, was scared to death of Paul Brown. He had a kind of aura about him. When he started to talk, you listened. With discipline and organization the order of the day, the Buckeyes under Brown made it an immediate turnaround, and in just two short years, they captured the national title. But what looked like the dawn of a new era of dominance was cut short by the tide of history and the outbreak of World War II. By 1943, most of the players in the 1942 team were serving their country. After the 1943 season, Brown enlisted in the Navy with the intention of coming back to Columbus. But when the fighting stopped, Brown took a job and part of the ownership of what became the Cleveland Browns. Brown's three short years left an indelible mark, but Buckeye fans can only wonder about what might have been. There's no doubt he would have had quite a few national championship teams for as many years as he wanted to coach. I think we, we just kind of missed out in that respect. Stocked with a cache of combustible talent, Ohio State's 1995 offense was a non-stop display of gridiron fireworks. Offensive explosion comes to mind when I think of the 1995 Ohio State offense. Very, very explosive. I mean, you have a tight end like Ricky Dudley, you have Terry Glenn on the outside, you have Bobby Hoying, you have Orlando Pace on one side. You got Eddie George in the backfield. That's all you gotta say right there. With potent weapons at every position, Coach John Cooper added his final bullet when he hired NFL offensive guru, Walt Harris. The turning point really was Walt Harris when he came in. And this stall brought a lot of excitement and creativity to the offense. He totally changed the way Ohio State now attacked the football game. That attack finished the season with over 30 new school records, including most points scored and most total yards. You weren't going to stop our offense. I mean, that was the bottom line. You can't stop them. We had really a pro offense playing college football. When the postseason awards were announced, the Buckeyes scored big yet again. We had so many talented players and it was exciting, but more importantly, these guys were great individuals that bought into the team concept that wanted to win. What more can you ask for? That is a combination that you can't stop. 
As a senior, Les Horvath helped lead the charge when the 1942 Buckeyes claimed the school's first national title. But after the season was over, a strange twist of fate put Les back on the field and his name in the history books. Les Horvath was the fine wingback on Coach Paul Brown's 1942 team, the first Ohio State team to capture the national title. Les went into dental school in 1943, but because of relaxed eligibility requirements during World War II, Les could come back and play an additional year in 1944, and he elected to do that. New coach Carol Widow switched Horvath to quarterback, and Les responded by leading the Buckeyes to the Big Ten title in an undefeated season. He made that 44 team tick through his leadership. I saw him play against Michigan that year. He drove that team to victory all by himself. The win over Michigan was the final notch in a 9-0 season good enough for second in the nation. And while the national title was captured by Army, the Heisman Trophy went to the grad student playing in Columbus. Les Horvath became Ohio State's very first Heisman Trophy winner and is the only Heisman Trophy winner who did not play the previous season. The 1969 Buckeyes were considered by many to be the team of the century, an unbeatable force with unprecedented power. But Michigan's new head coach felt otherwise, and his team's shocking 24-12 upset proved he was right. They were the greatest team in the country and the defending national champions. But when you win easily, you don't know what it is to really be in a tough battle. And they were in a tough battle here. The game cost the Buckeyes the national title and left the team with a taste for vengeance. It started that spring when we walked across that rug and that 24 to 12 score that was on it. And we worked on Michigan every Monday of the season. When the day finally came, the Buckeyes were back at number one and hungry for revenge. I have never seen a crowd like the crowd we had in 1970. It was 90% packed an hour and a half before game time. The anticipation was worth the wait as the Buckeyes down the fourth-ranked Wolverines 20-9 behind a well-oiled offense, a swarming defense, and plenty of desire. We were a good football team, don't get me wrong, but Ohio State was a better team. I don't think it was quite as good as the 69 team, but it was good. With a Big Ten title and a trip to the Rose Bowl riding on the line, Ohio State and Michigan met in Columbus for 1974's version of their annual blood feud. One unlikely player stepped forward to be the star of the game. The place kicking of Tom Claiborne against Michigan in 1974 was exceptional. The Buckeyes won that game 12 to 10 as Claiborne connected on four field goal attempts, three of them in excess of 40 yards. To kick four against Michigan at home, He'll never kick under more pressure in his life, and he just was on. Flabin's kicks brought the Buckeyes back from a 10-zip deficit and sent the Scholar and Gray West for their third straight Rose Bowl, but not before Michigan had a shot to win with a kick of their own. I'm standing right there on the hash mark, and I would say if that kick had been in Ann Arbor, we win the game. But in Columbus, we didn't win the game. For the Hungarian-born Klaibin, whose family escaped from behind the Iron Curtain, the performance was a record-setting feat on a historic day. It's the only time Ohio State has defeated Michigan without scoring a touchdown. That was unequivocally the finest day, I believe, for a kicker in the history of Ohio State. Ohio State's 1972 battle against North Carolina was not going as planned. Trailing seven zip and stuck in slow motion, an irate Woody Hayes was searching for answers. At the urging of assistant coach Rudy Hubbard, Hayes called on a little known freshman from Columbus by the name of Griffin. Rudy kept going, Archie's right, Archie's right. You know, I think Woody just kind of got tired of hearing it and finally said, you know, we'll put him in. I was so excited I forgot to take my helmet. I mean, I couldn't believe he meant for me to go into the game. But I don't even think they had Archie's name in the program, if I recall. We just looked at him, told him, hold on to football. He was the rest of his history. In a little over three quarters of play, Archie rushed for 239 yards, a new school record taking him from scout team tailback to statewide hero. 
that was the start of Archie, and he just went and went and went. Once he got in and made his mark there, you knew that this was the start of something big at Ohio State. And what a thrill to be able to witness that and know that he was destined for greatness from that point on. I went into the game thinking that, you know, this is my great opportunity. If I can get in here and, you know, just make a touchdown or, or make a long run, you know, he might consider me for the varsity team. And so uh, I always count that as a miracle in my life, that particular game. Accomplishing what he did that day on the field was, was phenomenal. And that's what Ohio State football is all about. With hands of glue and feet with wings, Chris Carter soared to instant stardom. And in just three seasons, he set a new standard by which Buckeye receivers would forever be judged. Touchdown! The kind of player that sometimes just made you stop and stare. He's made some of the best catches I've ever seen, ever. Great athlete, excellent athlete, highly motivated individual. Chris always wanted to excel. He wasn't a, a real, real fast guy, but uh, he was so smart and had such a knack for getting the football in. And he was a gamer. As a freshman, Chris capped his sensational debut season with a Rose Bowl record nine catches for 172 yards. The following year, he set a new Ohio State record for catches and was named All Big Ten. The year after that, he reset his reception record and was named All-American. When Chris Carter went up, I had no doubt in my mind that he was going to come down with that football because Chris has a winning attitude and he's not going to be denied. But before his final season, Carter was declared ineligible for signing with an agent. His career in Columbus was over. Forced to go pro, Chris went on to become one of the NFL's biggest stars, his previous troubles a distant memory. You know, he made a mistake, and fortunately, Chris has turned his life around and had a Hall of Fame career. For that, I'm grateful. Part mild-mannered gentleman, part defensive terror, Randy Gratishar proved that nice guys don't always finish last. He's really laid back and real easy going, but the intensity was the opposite. Boy, oh, sideline to sideline. Randy Gratishar was just an unbelievable guy. And yet you'd look at him and you'd think, this is a football player? Get real. A first-team All-American in 1972 and 73, Randy was a linchpin to one of Ohio State's greatest defenses ever, the Stonewall unit of 1973. Gratishar was not only an intense ball player and a hard hitter, but he was very intelligent. He's a smart, smart player and certainly was a great athlete. When I got here, I saw guys like Randy Gratishar, and I said, man, they've got linebackers running that fast. Oh, man, it's going to be tough. Woody Hayes called Randy the best linebacker he ever coached in seven all-pro seasons in the NFL showed why. But Randy's teammates remembered him as much for his off-field demeanor as his on-field abilities. Great person, great individual. I really love playing with him. Learned a lot. Uh, I just I can't say enough good things about Randy Ashcraft. When Mike Lantry's last-minute field goal sailed wide left, Ohio State and Michigan's 73 battle ended in a 10-10 tie. But with the teams now tied for the Big Ten crown, the league's athletic directors were forced to take an unprecedented vote to see who would go to the Rose Bowl. I automatically assumed that we weren't going to the Rose Bowl. Well, everybody thought Michigan would go to the Rose Bowl, including Woody Hayes because he congratulated me and he says, this team will do a great job in the Rose Bowl. But to Shim Beckler's surprise, the vote went the Buckeyes' way, causing joy in Columbus and angst in Ann Arbor. If ever anybody probably had the, the idea that they wanted to kill somebody, it was Bo Shim Beckler. I don't think Bo ever got over it. He, 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 that was stuck in his craw forever. Michigan should have gone to the Rose Bowl in 73. I made no bones about it, and I'm still bitter about it. The vote ended up being like six to four, and it was in our favor, and uh, I think it was the right vote. We were the best team. I really felt that. We played that well all year long. The statistics bared that out, and I just think that we were the best team. I know we were the best team. The Buckeyes proved their worth six weeks later in Pasadena, when they trounced the Southern Cal 42 to 21. Us winning that football game, I think, kept a lot of people pretty quiet. He was a starting left tackle the second he walked on campus, and his dominating play forced stat keepers to create a new category, the pancake. And for many, Orlando Pace is the greatest offensive lineman in the history of college football. 
I don't know if anybody that's ever played their position better than Orlando Pace did. Hey, if you want to talk about just straight up athletic ability, technique, Orlando Pace is the best tackle of all times. I don't think he ever didn't just kill people. It didn't really matter who he was up against. I remember Orlando playing against other All-Americans, and he would drive them 15 yards downfield and put them on their back. He could be 30 yards down the field blinking a block, and he could be on the line pancaking someone. Orlando's mixture of size, strength, and speed overwhelmed opponents and made him the cornerstone for some of Ohio State's most prolific offenses. And with two Lombardi Awards and an Outland Trophy, Orlando's legacy stacks up with the best of them. It's just an honor to say that you play with a great athlete like that. And I owe a lot of my success to Orlando in college. For a true freshman to come in here and start every game he played, to win the Outland Lombardi two years in a row, to be the first guy taken in the draft, I mean, I don't know how you top that. He was the pint-sized scooter with a big-time heart. His parents called him Howard. Buckeye fans knew him as Hopalong. I'm not sure Ohio State ever had a player who could make the big play when you needed it the most any more than Hopalong Cassidy. Hoppy was just lights up everything. A firebrand, a hot-headed kid who just charmed everybody. Cassidy scored three touchdowns in his very first game in 1952 to launch one of Ohio State's most legendary careers. In 1954, Hop led the Buckeyes to the national title, saving the career of another certain Buckeye legend. Woody Hayes often said that Hopalong Cassidy in that 1954 team probably saved his job because had the Buckeyes been about a 50-50 team in 1954, uh, chances are he might have been replaced uh, going into the 1955 season. Woody stuck around and Hop became his workhorse, making big time plays on both sides of the ball. Hoppy never got hurt. Throw him into a brick wall and there was no doubt but what he was going to beat the brick wall. Hop's grit and determination were fully rewarded in 1955 when he was awarded the Heisman Trophy, securing his place at the heart of Buckeye lore. When number one Iowa rolled into Columbus, experts said the 85 Buckeyes didn't have a prayer. But what Hayden Fry's Hawkeyes never saw coming was a team and a crowd that believed in miracles. And in the paper, they said Chuck Long was going to throw for 1,000 yards against us. And this really motivated them to go out and play what was probably maybe the top game of their entire careers. We had nothing to lose. Everyone stepped up and did what they had to do in order for us to you know, get a W in that game. Never was that stadium more alive than that day. That was an exciting time. Uh, two good Big Ten teams. The thing I remember most about it was the rain. It's a torrential downpour. Everyone's going crazy. And you got the number one team in the nation on the ropes. By the end of the rain-soaked day, Ohio State's defense had tallied four picks, a blocked punt for a safety, and one of the Horseshoe's most dramatic fourth down stops ever. But if people expect you to lose and you just go out and just go crazy, that's how the upsets happen because they have nothing to lose and they take their game up to a different level. And of all the football games I ever played in, that was the ultimate team victory because every aspect of the game, offense, defense, special teams, coaches, it all came together and formed a perfect game. He could kick, he could pass, play defense, and return punts. And that's when he wasn't running the ball as a halfback. Vic Janowitz could do it all, and he did it better than anyone. There wasn't a thing that Vic Janowitz couldn't do. He excelled both offensively and defensively. He had an ability to see things like no other football player in Ohio Stadium. Perhaps no game better demonstrated Vic's all-around talent than his one-man demolition of Iowa in 1950. Vic passed for four touchdowns that afternoon, scored two more, kicked 10 extra points, did all the kickoffs, and when he wasn't doing that, he was playing defensive safety. Even more remarkable was that Vic did most of his damage in the first 30 minutes of play. Ohio State won that game 83 to 21, and Vic Harvey played in the second half. It was truly one of the great individual performances in college football history. Vic's heroics did not go unnoticed, and when the season was over, he was named Ohio State's second Heisman Trophy winner. Those who witnessed Vic back in the day still marvel at his amazing talent. Perhaps the most complete ball player 
that I've ever seen. Best football player I've seen in the stadium in the last 50 years. We're more than halfway there on our path to number one. So don't stop now. We've got Rose Bowls, Snow Bowls, and Mandated No Bowls coming up, plus a few surprises in between. So join us next time as we continue counting down the Buckeyes 50 Greatest. For Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching.